Business Breakdowns is sponsored by Tegas. We created Business Breakdowns to uncover the lessons and frameworks behind every business, and that's what makes Tegas our perfect launch partner. Much of the foundational prep for these episodes gets started with research powered by Tegas. With Tegas, you can learn about any public or private company directly from former execs, customers, and industry experts, all of whom are in a position to offer unique insights into a company's growth, its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. It offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies like Coinbase, Hinge Health, and Farfetch. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas also allows you access to experts for $300 a call, not the $1,000 or more that others charge. I can personally say that some of the most thoughtful investors in the world use Tegas and talk about it often. If you're ready to go deeper on any company and you appreciate the value of primary research, head to tegas.co slash breakdowns for a free trial. That's tegas.co slash breakdowns. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Hello, and welcome to Business Breakdowns. I'm your host, Zach Fuss. In this conversation, we will be studying Cinnabon. Founded in Seattle in 1985, Cinnabon is one of the leading indulgent food brands and is owned by parent company Focus Brands alongside the likes of Auntie Anne's and Carvel. Cinnabon currently operates in almost 50 countries with more than 1,500 franchise locations. But the true secret of the business is the brand's ability to travel across restaurants, consumer packaged goods, and retail. In this breakdown, we start with Cinnabon's scale and an overview of its fascinating history. We then dive into what really makes Cinnabon special, its omni-channel ecosystem and how it balances franchisees, licensing deals, and distribution through other channels while maintaining its brand ethos. To help me break down Cinnabon, I'm joined today by Kat Cole, the former COO and president of North America for Focus Brands. Prior to that role, she was the president of Cinnabon. Kat's operating and investing experience in this space and her deep understanding of the brand makes her the perfect guest to break down Cinnabon. Please enjoy this breakdown. So Kat, we are so excited to have you join us to break down the Cinnabon story. Given your experience as an executive, an operator, a brand builder, an investor, a mentor, you're uniquely situated to help us better understand Cinnabon the concept. I don't think people appreciate the global scale of the brand, how many restaurants. So maybe just to help us quantify the scale and complexity of their operations, and then we'll dig in from there. Yeah. So I'll start with global product sales, which is not a metric a lot of restaurant companies use because they typically only have one channel, restaurants. But because Cinnabon is so extended as a brand into many channels with so many SKUs around the world. It's important to start there. All the places that people can buy a Cinnabon product and all the different Cinnabon products they can buy, it depends on the year. Believe it or not, it can flex by hundreds of millions of dollars in a year because of some of these license partnerships. But the annual sales of consumer products around the world through franchising and licensing will range anywhere from one to two billion in sales per year. And those flexing up and down periods come from large food service partnerships, typically. The difference between one and two billion literally could be a single product in a QSR chain. That's the magnitude of the transactions happening around the world. It is, again, depending on the year, typically somewhere between 30% franchise, 70% alternate channels. As the years go on, that could shift up or down by 10 points, but it surprises people because it clearly suggests that although the franchise business is in fact what the brand is most known for, for the last many years, it has been in the technical minority 
of the dollars of transactions and numbers of transactions, yet it is still growing very successfully. The franchise business is in 60 countries around the world. A majority of the geographic concentration outside of North America is in the Middle East. And then, of course, there's some South and Central America, some Europe, things that are growing, but really densely populated, really densely penetrated in the Gulf. At one point, there were close to 150 locations in Saudi alone. Cinnabon's been in the Middle East for well over 25 years. So that gives a sense of some of the the magnitude. And in terms of CPG, it's in over 100,000 points of retail distribution. That could be grocery stores, hotel chains, other restaurant chains, gas stations, anywhere packaged food is sold. So the evolution of Cinnabon into this multi-billion dollar multinational company actually came from pretty humble beginnings, if I understand correctly. Can we talk a little bit about the originations of the brand and how it was built over time? The beautiful thing about all these brands and what often many forget is they all started as one. <laughs> you know, So Cinnabon's actual history is a father-son duo in Seattle, Washington, Rich Komen, the father, Greg Komen, the son, partnered with a woman named Gerilyn Brousseau, a famous baker in Seattle, Washington, also known as the Cinnamom, to come up with the world's greatest cinnamon roll. And they did this because Rich and Greg actually attempted first to license the rights to expand another cinnamon roll chain that would eventually slowly fade into history called TJ Cinnamons. And TJ Cinnamons did not want to franchise or license their business. And it gave Rich and Greg the full license, ironically, (laughs) to go start their own, which they called Cinnabon. And they worked for months on this particular cinnamon roll. They knew they wanted it to be large and indulgent. Gerilyn had a long history of humanitarian work in Indonesia. And so she was intimately familiar with Indonesian Karinchi cinnamon, and they came up with a way to mill this cinnamon so it's more gooey and aromatic. And so you put all these very interesting nuances together. People who are passionate about launching a cinnamon roll business paired with a phenomenal chef with expertise in particular ingredients, choosing how to manufacture it so it performed differently in the baking process, and then making a critical operating decision that would make it difficult to duplicate, imitate, and for others to compete with it, and also make it incredibly special. And that was not only the recipe, but it was the realization that if they baked it in a certain way and pulled it out before many others would from the oven, it would have this ooey gooey center. And then the only way to deliver that experience to the customer was to always have it be hot out of the oven, which meant it had to be held hot but you can't hold something hot for too long or it will get hard and crunchy and sort of end up on the other side of the product spectrum. So the innovation decisions of that one skew to make it large, to make it with this Indonesian Karinchi cinnamon that would be labeled Makara cinnamon because of its proprietary milling process for Cinnabon, the decision to pull it out of the oven sooner, the decision to hold it hot, the operations required to constantly have new product coming out of the oven all day, which, oh, by the way, is what resulted in the aroma coming from the businesses. Those decisions before there was ever one unit were critical in setting it up for a level of differentiation that would allow it to become an icon of several generations and to become highly licensable. The other critical decision was opening in a mall where there was captured traffic, where people would be enticed by the product and be in a mode to indulge and treat themselves, which is typically shopping, traveling, vacationing. That is the highest permission behavior to indulge that humans give themselves. And that location was so small because of course they weren't confident enough to buy a big space that the ovens were forced to be at the front. And that is what produced all of the aroma. And we would later learn over half of the impulse and transactions. The second unit, they decided to put the ovens in the back and sales dropped materially because the oven was not up front. So as much as people like to think that the aroma is manufactured and that there are fans that blow it out into the world, it is literally the result of learning by accident that 
the ovens and opening the doors constantly, just like they fill our homes, if they are closer to the counter, produce an aroma that people can then be tempted by and they'll approach the counter. So those were the humble, humble beginnings to units just one and two. If you reflect on what it is today and its franchise model, I think from an outsider's perspective, sometimes we think that franchises are easy. There's a Dunkin' Donuts in every corner. Domino's is ubiquitous. There's a Burger King and McDonald's everywhere you look. Every airport and auto stop has a Cinnabon, but it's not easy. It's a super complex, in some ways, vertically integrated business. How did you guys wrap your hands around all this and consider kind of all the key stakeholders? You have corporate employees, store level employees, franchisees, brand partners, your private equity owners. I can't imagine it was easy to manage, but you guys did a, an amazing job when you were there. Can we talk a little bit about all the key stakeholders at play here? So if you bridge from those humble beginnings to when it had enough units to be viewed as a chain, as a legitimate brand that was scaling, it was corporately owned for quite some time. Ironically, Greg and Rich were driven to innovate and create this brand because in part, they couldn't get the license rights to another one, but even they avoided franchising for many years. They didn't want their baby in someone else's hands. They were printing cash <laughs> in those early days, and they didn't have the pressure of someone else's capital to accelerate growth beyond their comfort zone. So they could grow how they wanted, when they wanted, making money along the way, these incredibly profitable businesses, paying high rent in premium malls and airports, but still incredibly profitable. It wasn't until someone approached them who inspired their confidence that they considered and then allowed their first franchisee over on the East Coast. And that then turned them as founder, owner, CEO operators into franchisors. The business actually went through, before it ever landed with Focus Brands, went through many changes in ownership, including being owned by AFC Corporation, its then name, which at the time owned Popeyes. So it was Popeyes, Cinnabon, Seattle's Best Coffee, and churches actually back then, they had decided to divest of their non-chicken assets. And so they sold Cinnabon and Seattle's Best Coffee. And the founders of Rourke were at the table. They had a few years back bought Carvel ice cream and saw the potential of Cinnabon and ended up getting the international rights for Seattle's Best Coffee along with Cinnabon. Since many of the Cinnabons around the world, especially in the Middle East and Japan, are co-branded with Seattle's Best Coffee. So they were a bit intertwined and it made sense for that international transaction to occur. So now it's in the hands of what was Rourke and Carvel, now with Cinnabon becomes Focus Brands. Now it's a portfolio company that is expert in food and franchising. So I'll, that's an important journey to map. And then I'll park there to describe the stakeholders. So the stakeholders at that time were Rourke Capital, this phenomenal private equity firm that now is the largest restaurant owner in the U.S. So you've got Carvel and Cinnabon. So you have two brands, separate companies in a holding company called Focus Brands. So you have Focus Brands, the franchisor. You have Rourke Capital, the whole owner and private equity sponsor. There were corporately owned operations in Cinnabon. So Cinnabon, the company, had its own managers and employees and now the franchisees, the franchisees' employees, and then, of course, customers of the business. Those were the key stakeholders. Even then, there was a fledgling licensed business that was brewing between Cinnabon and Pillsbury. It was one of the first large licensed businesses for the brand to partner with a commercial bakery company to go into grocery. Cinnabon had played around with lip balm and lotion and these interesting ideas people have to sort of get a flavored product into other things that often have aroma and flavors. But Cinnabon is much better and acceptable intellectually for something you put in your body versus on your body. Lotions and lip balms faded into the background. So now you have the beginnings of the ecosystem of stakeholders. Owner, franchisor, corporate entity, corporately owned stores, franchisees, and their entire ecosystem, and the beginnings of a licensee population. That's a really great place, I think, to start to talk about 
the framework that you've used around brands being focused on relevance and differentiation and how you take this incredibly dynamic and rich asset and lean in to where it has a right to play. Truly, if you break down any brand, anything that's worth noting about the brand can fit into these two buckets, relevance and differentiation. I've never seen another bucket that you couldn't heavily debate those things belong still under relevance and differentiation. And the watch out is that the biggest brands, the best brands that live over time, maintain some growth and harmony in both areas. And there are some brands whose literal demise is driven by them getting out of whack. They're highly differentiated, right? They're super unique. Think Rolls Royce, but they're not relevant to enough consumers for it to really matter. And then the same, something can be highly relevant, affordable, accessible, within arm's reach, people get and need and want the product, but it's not differentiated. And so that's a commodity. It's a race to the bottom from a pricing perspective. You don't have a lot of premium layers into the category or in the brands. And so those are examples of where it can get out of whack and they're the extremes. And the idea is high relevance, high differentiation. And differentiation being it is clearly and obviously distinct from other things in the marketplace as judged by consumers, not the company. And relevant simply being, it matters in my life today. And the things that make it matter in my life today are about product and price and positioning, but they're also about how accessible is it? Can I find it? Can I get it when I want it? If not, it moves out of relevance. And then relevance also has to do with how contemporary it looks and feels. And that is brand and logo and brick and mortar and all of that. So when I joined Cinnabon, it was 2010. Rourke and Focus Brands had owned it for quite some time. There were four brands in the portfolio. And literally right after I joined, we bought Auntie Anne's. So now we've got another snack brand, which I could, as the new president of the brand, compare and contrast Cinnabon too, from a brick and mortar standpoint, and also realized there were some capabilities Auntie Anne's had that Cinnabon could benefit from in terms of malls, real estate, other types of infrastructure. My assessment of Cinnabon in 2010, after it had been battered by the recession, I mean, in the great recession in any period of compressed discretionary income, there are two things people stop doing, shopping and traveling. And Cinnabon was mostly in malls and airports. So it was just brutal from a top line perspective. And most of the franchisees, other than one very large one, were very small. So they couldn't handle that level of top line degradation for a prolonged period of time, especially those that were new. And as a result, there were years of deferred CapEx. No one updated their buildings. They looked old and dated. They probably started making some bad short-term decisions to just survive raising prices, which is not a good thing. In most cases, certainly not in a recession. Buying off-spec product, lowering the staffing levels, sort of this like quality reduction, death by a thousand cuts. So that made the relevance of the brand low. It was only in malls and airports, again, with a few exceptions. It looked old and dated, The product wasn't being marketed or innovated or evolving, the menu itself. And so it was just losing relevance by its own design, as well as through environmental dynamics and economic dynamics. So relevance was low, yet differentiation was still radically high. There was no one that was making anything as delicious, large, aromatic, indulgent, and distinct as Cinnabon in the bakery world. So that suggested there was something there to salvage. And underneath that, the business model was crumbling because of the economics of malls and the lack of traffic that once were the reason you would pay those premium rents, which ranged from 18 to 22% of sales. I mean, it is literally two to three X street side rent. But the math works, you know, when the top line comes. So this situation of lowered relevance, decreasing relevance, but protected original differentiation needed to be addressed on top of the fundamental business model of the franchise business, and then roll all that up, a crisis of confidence from the franchisees and a fear of the future. And you're in a bad place when people don't have some belief that tomorrow will be better than today. This realization led us to a few areas of investment. One was, 
we had to work on the core brick and mortar of the business. But that was incredibly difficult when that takes capital in a period of reduced sales, when the last business owner a bank would give a loan to is someone who is building a bakery business famous for sugar and fat at the height of the Adkins craze in a mall at the height of the Great Recession. Even if they had access to capital, that's the last person a bank would be loaning money. And so this issue of, I see what we need to do, but I'm not sure the franchisees have the confidence to do it, nor do they have the ability to write the check themselves. So that was an assessment of something we had to tackle for the core business and the relevance of the actual operations, both economically and visually to the consumer. And that takes money. At the same time, there was this growing, powerful partnership with Pillsbury and a few other brands where Cinnabon had licensed its brand, its innovation, and its cinnamon to one of the country in North America's largest commercial bakery company, General Mills, Pillsbury being a division of General Mills. And that license partnership started because Pillsbury recognized it owned a certain tier of refrigerated dough, which was more entry and mid-market, mass market, and they would benefit from a premium tier of product. And Cinnabon clearly owned in the hearts and minds of consumers the premium bakery credibility. So put those two things together, Cinnabon's getting distribution, marketing, eyeballs on shelf, Pillsbury's getting an accelerated premium product that they actually can get a higher basket and credibility because they're not trying to say, hey, we're Pillsbury, we're making something fancy. They're saying we're Pillsbury, we've partnered with Cinnabon to bring you something powerful. And that inherently is the nature of license deals, collabs, and partnerships is finding what each of you have and bringing it together. So one plus one equals three or more. And it became apparent that there was a lot more opportunity in that channel, grocery and CPG. There was also a, the beginnings of a licensing business in wholesale food service. So not just grocery, but coming up with ideas of selling Cinnabon product in other places where there is immediate consumption. CPG is future consumption. You buy it, it's in a box, you take it home, you eat it later. Immediate consumption is restaurants, cafes, places where people sit and eat. There was such an ability to license and sell ingredients recipes, and fully made products to other places that had thousands of points of distribution in order to get more product or version of the product in people's hands to build the brand in the ecosystem. The tension between those two things is at the same time, the legacy business needs to be invested in and grown and made more relevant. The fear, not necessarily a rational one, but an understandable one, is that if you go put a new cool product in some other channel while the legacy channel is struggling, one will overtake the other. And the reality was that both the money and the marketing that came from expanding the product in alternative innovation channels would be the exact thing the legacy business needed to get the boost for us to co-invest in them remodeling their locations in the franchise business, the legacy business, and to boost the marketing fund so that we could tell the story of the business ahead of the revenue growth that would eventually come back once the recession went away. I think that people may not appreciate the dynamics between franchisee and franchisor when it comes to channel expansion. And I've certainly studied a number of cases where that balance and that trust was lost. And unfortunately, the brand stole sales from the franchisees and it didn't work in the way it did for Cinnabon. You talk about these concentric circles that represent the business. What is it about Cinnabon that has made that transition towards a more ecosystem approach so successful? Cinnabon's success in building an omni-channel brand ecosystem is reliant on a few key pillars or tent poles. One is the brand itself being insanely differentiated and high quality. None of this works without that world famous cinnamon roll being made the same way, rolled in store, fresh baked, like breathing life into an emotion and memory and nostalgia into consumers who later want a little taste of it somewhere else. Creating that latent demand is one of the pillars. The other is the people side. There were enough franchisees, not all of them, but an influential few, 
who believed and could get on board with an expanded view of the brand. And they get a ton of credit for helping us lead the system into what is now a very relevant way to build brands even outside of food, but then was quite a novel concept. And then our leadership team, when I joined and several other people who were willing to go through the pain, and it was pain, to have the discussions and the tension between I'm the franchisor, I'm the owner of the brand, it is my job to know what's best and do it, and the balance of, but I can't move so far so fast that I leave you behind. We must do this together, which means I've got to find a way to help you see every bit of value it can bring, which meant finding ways to revenue share, finding ways to have them literally share in the benefit of the growth of other channels, and through making many mistakes, putting in systems and practices that allowed them to be informed at several points along the way as something was being developed and allowed them appropriate input that would help us come up with the best version of product names, product pricing structures, placement, marketing strategies, so that it really did end up delighting consumers and not confusing them. And that was driven in part because we embraced the art and the science of an omni-channel ecosystem, the heart and the hustle of it. And the brands that have made the mistake of building one channel at the expense of the other have just leaned too much in the hustle and the money and not pause to think and walk that walk together. You can move from walk to run pretty quickly if you build trust. But if you don't have trust, the franchisees or any key stakeholder can get in your way down the road in pretty material ways. And so it is advantageous to go a little slower at the beginning so you can go much faster together as not only you lean into opportunities you're creating, but once we started building this omni-channel ecosystem and the brand started popping up in Coffee Creamer, in Taco Bell, in Burger King, these are big, big players with lots of visibility, more requests came our way for the brand to go in these other places. One of my favorite partnerships based upon the success of it is the channel development with Burger King. It'd be great to kind of hear about how that partnership came to fruition and the economic power of it for you guys. It was juicier than many will ever know for everyone, including the flame broiled operators as well. Cinnabon started because we actually put a little bit of energy and investment at Focus Brands around the food service channel. It wasn't an accident. It didn't happen out of thin air. We were already licensing in other channels and grocery. We already had a product at Taco Bell that had gone on for many years, um, still has gone on today with Cinnabon Delight. So we had gotten a little comfortable with a branded product being in fast food through the Taco Bell partnership with a donut, a very differentiated product with Taco Bell Delights. The Burger King opportunity was more of a specific solve for their desire to expand their sweet offerings. To Burger King's credit, realized and appreciated the power of brands. And I remember us having conversations with some other fast food chains and other restaurant brands who didn't want to put another brand's brand on their menu. They said, we'll build it ourselves. Well, fair enough. Good luck getting credibility in cinnamon rolls if your expertise is burgers or fried chicken. To Burger King's credit and the leadership team at that time, and this was not long after the 3G transaction, they had a mindset for innovation and brands that allowed the deal to move forward. You know, After months of discussion and ideas and it's stalling out, the new innovation mindset that they put in place and appreciation for what a branded product could do to drive basket and transactions and frequency for some consumers, that was the unlock from the Burger King side of things. And then the conversations went from slow and frustrating to super fast and we can barely keep up. And we had talked about many different products, French toast sticks, Burger King prior to Rourke's ownership actually had a Cinnabon, I think it was a pie or a cheesecake on the menu back in the eighties or something, eighties or early nineties. And we played around the menu with something that would meet their need for a sweet product. But what the research kept coming back to is a small cinnamon roll. That was internally for Cinnabon and our conversations with our most trusted franchisees, a very delicate discussion. We are known for cinnamon rolls. This is our baby. Are we seriously thinking about putting a smaller but real version of what we make in the hands of 7,000 
fast food operations that we don't own or control. I don't know if anyone who's listening has ever been in these moments where you feel the fear. It's partly exhilarating and it's also brings pressure and stress and anxiety. Like there are almost as many reasons to do it as not to do it, but you want to break through that feeling because the reality is there probably is more upside than downside, but you got to get out of that fear mode of a really big opportunity. And so instead of asking, well, should we do it or should we not do it? We change to how could we do it? How could we protect the brand, the name, the product, and the operations to make sure we're honoring the brand? It is a Cinnabon worthy cinnamon roll, even operated out of world famous burger chain. And how can we feel so good about that financially? We're getting paid enough for that stress and connection to the brand. And we're then investing enough of that back in Q&A and training and support for Burger King, as well as marketing the brand, that it becomes a no-brainer. And we figured it out together. It wasn't easy, but it happened pretty quickly. And there was a third stakeholder in that discussion, and it was the manufacturer of what would be the pre-formed. It wasn't pre-baked. Burger King was baking it fresh all day, every day. It was a requirement of ours, if it is a cinnamon roll, that it couldn't just show up like a pastry and all these other places and be sat there or nuked. It had to be baked fresh from that state and maintained all throughout. And that third stakeholder was our partner, General Mills. This triangle of the company that we are working with to protect our ingredients and our processes and our IP, Burger King being the retailer with the need of an indulgent baked good for early morning and late night, And Cinnabon with the ability and the desire to expand distribution more quickly, like that is the three-legged stool. And very quickly it moved from idea, the lab, like actual in Burger King's headquarters in Miami, baking it out, figuring out how it would work in a Burger King layout of a kitchen, to a few test stores, to an expanded test, to an accelerated rollout with hundreds of millions of dollars spent from Burger King to market this product. All I can say about the outcome is that it was certainly one of the most high volume and profitable in terms of gross profit skews for Burger King during its three-year run. It was a three-year contract. It stayed all three years. It was one of the most radically high economic impact endeavors that Cinnabon had at any point in its journey. And it brought a level of visibility and awareness to both Burger King that gave them new customers and happier customers that were willing to spend a little more and more visibility for Cinnabon that translated into higher sales, even in the mall business. There's a lot more magic and misery behind the scenes over the three years, including running out of product, unexpected promotions. But those are all small in comparison to what is still one of the greatest restaurant brand to restaurant brand collabs of all time. That's some amazing inside baseball. Some of those little nuggets that you shared at the end there speak to the difficulty of entrusting your brand with somebody else. And in the pre-show, we we spoke a bit about this concept of an equity bucket and the need to be constantly refilling it and supporting that bucket. And I'd love to kind of explore that concept further as to why some brands are so successful in these collaborations and others just fall flat out on it. The magic is this understanding of what your brand stands for and where it has permission to travel and where it doesn't. And many brands haven't done that work. They've either been successful despite not being able to articulate those things, or they haven't been battle tested. Something hasn't really put it under pressure. And understanding what a brand is, what it stands for, separate of what it sells, is a part of brand architecture work that really great brand managers understand. And when you understand that, then you realize that sits in this equity bucket. And I went to get the advice of the Coca-Cola company here in Atlanta, arguably one of the great brand managers of all time. They're up there in the top decile, if not higher, of IP and ability to build and manage a brand, Coca-Cola being the pinnacle of that. And the question I had for them was, how do you keep building a brand when it appears to be attempting to become ubiquitous and everywhere. And Coke at some point had the stated or unstated mission statement of being in arm's reach of everyone, which of course is it's everywhere. And that conflicted with what I had been taught and learned, which is scarcity drives value. 
So how can you build value if you're not protecting scarcity? And the reality is there is a way to make ubiquity or being in many places actually accretive to the brand. If you understand what the brand stands for, understand that it's equity is in this idea of an equity bucket and anything that is different than the core equity doesn't mean it's good or bad, just different. That causes the consumer to connect the brand to something else is drawing on that equity bucket. So for Cinnabon being a cinnamon roll product, but actually standing for moments of indulgence and the tagline, life needs frosting. That if life needs frosting, it's about, we might not be good for your butt, but we're good for your soul. Everyone deserves a moment to indulge. And if you're going to indulge, it had better be so delicious that being bad, and make no mistake, it's being bad. Being bad is so worth it. If you're in the being bad business, You've got to make it clear that you're being bad, right? Own that it's an indulgence and then make it so worth it for those discretionary calories, indulging in sugar, whatever that is. That's an honest way to build an indulgent brand. And Cinnabon as a brand and we as a team were super clear on what we were and what we stood for. Understanding that that's the equity bucket. That's what gives us permission to go places. But if we go into coffee, if we go into ice cream, if we go into cereal, all of which we did, It is still technically drawing on the bank account, on the equity bank account. And so some investment in that equity bucket, retelling the brand origin story, reminding people of the core product, literally taking points of revenue, points of cash from those very profitable innovation channels and actually plowing it back into the franchise business to refill that equity bucket is an important part of a branded ecosystem in food or not in food, to continue to elevate the mother brand, Cinnabon as an idea, Cinnabon as an emotion, to continue to elevate it above and outside of the many ways it might be expressed in the marketplace. And so we touched on it briefly, but it's an important nuance in the Cinnabon story that we haven't spent a ton of time exploring is focus and the house of brands that it represents and where Cinnabon kind of slots in there and why it's important and strategically advantaged to be part of a bigger ecosystem. Focus Brands is the parent company of Cinnabon and other brands, Auntie Anne's, Jamba, McAllister's, Moe's, Schlotzky's, and Carvel Ice Cream, as well as the licensor of Seattle's Best Coffee internationally. The company grows through acquisition. And I had the pleasure to be there for 10 years, just wrapped up as president and COO at the beginning of this year. And I had a front row seat and hand in building the power of the portfolio, to your point. You know, a few things I think should be appreciated. One, it's incredibly expensive to compete in restaurants today. It does take access to data. You do have to invest in technology and infrastructure. You do need to be able to battle down your cost of goods. All of that is easier with scale. And yes, a single brand can grow at scale, but only so fast. But when we paired Carvel, and then Focus and Rourke bought Cinnabon, now you've got more purchases of, say, napkins, right? And so you get a lower price on napkins. And then you start adding brands, and not all these brands buy the same things in the same categories, but even using supply chain and purchasing as an example, the ability to, over time, mitigate cost increases, sometimes that's the best you can do, or actually lower costs is a massive value add to franchisees in theory and in reality. It's harder than people would think because not everyone likes to buy the same straw in the same cup, but it is a critical enabler to profitability for franchisees while other costs just natively are going up in the environment and in the space. The other piece is access to talent. The Focus Brands ecosystem as it's grown to not simply be a hold co of individual entities, but a company in and of itself with departments, capabilities, and resources that the brand teams draw on, plug into, are supported by, that is a competitive advantage. You know, Focus built this licensing group, this expert group in taking a restaurant brand commercially to market in other restaurants in CPG and grocery and e-com, et cetera. And now that that machine is built, because of Cinnabon, because of Carvel, it then enabled Auntie Anne's. As soon as we bought Jamba and took it private, 
guess what channels we layered on to Jamba, right? Bringing products, not a lot, not as many as Cinnabon, but a few that made sense for Jamba to bring to market in other channels. And that happened smarter, faster, and with more confidence with the franchisees because Focus Brands had a team that had seen how the movie ends. They know how to talk to franchisees. They know how to take restaurant brands to market. We already had relationships with manufacturers and brokers and retailers. We're already meeting with Target. So they want to talk about Jamba. We're already meeting with Walmart. They want to talk about the other brands. So you can see the what the tech world may call the flywheel effect here of all the networks of customers, retail partnerships, manufacturers, and then simply a leadership muscle to be able to help brand teams lead through channel expansion that would otherwise be, to your point, of other companies that have struggled, volatile, bumpy, difficult, distracting from the core business. Focus over time as it acquired brands that at any stage would be considered mature or maturing has built capabilities to reinvigorate the brands, accelerate growth globally in countries around the world, evaluate the brand for its licensing potential and bring that to market very quickly. And and, oh, by the way, be better at franchising than that brand was before franchise sales, real estate development, you know, all these things, including marketing and customer expertise are capabilities that sit in various areas at focus in what's now categories in focus, snacks and restaurants. And then yes, within the brands that support the franchisees. Being a part of focus brands, it's an unfair advantage, but it's a required one to protect margin and profitability in a highly competitive environment where the very channels that are growing fastest, like delivery, are naturally margin compressing. You got to save points somewhere else in the PL to lean into those top line drivers, even though they're margin compressing, while you figure out kind of the reset of the channel mix of the business. Yeah, the ability to borrow from other areas to invest in where the growth is definitely seems to be a competitive advantage. So, Kat, obviously, Cinnabon has a ton of success in licensing through different channels and approaches. But I imagine that the opportunity is limitless. And in a time period where there's so much margin compression at the store level, whether it be through labor, delivery aggregators, landlords, how do you balance the attractiveness of the licensing opportunities with maintaining your core channel partners that are creating so much value for you guys? I remember when we were really accelerating our food service expansion, it was like Taco Bell at first, then Burger King, then KFC, then Sonic, plus all the grocery expansion. And I was meeting with a core group of franchisees and it was overwhelming for them. I mean, the the franchise business continued to grow still to this day. One has not happened at the expense of the other. As we've talked about, the innovation channels actually helped the franchise business sort of have a resurgence in front of mind awareness and relevance. Plus it gave us some money to go invest in the business with them. But I remember one franchisee that I love and respect so much and he goes, why do you even need us? He brought up the same point, this question, like, you don't even need us. Why are you even wasting your time listening to our gripes? I looked at him deadpan and said, I get it. The numbers look like one so far outpaces the other. And yes, licensing is far more profitable from a flow through perspective to the franchisor than franchising is. But back to those concentric circles, None of that licensing opportunity is available without a healthy, relevant base brand. If I were to suggest that let's just lean into this 70 plus percent EBITDA margin licensing business, partnerships, own no assets, get the brand out there, sell the recipes. It's just an IP business. It's like 15 people hawking out the IP everywhere like NASCAR, slapping the logo. Over time, it would wane. Over time, it would not be rooted in anything, right? It's a license of a license of a license. And then who wants a dated sort of has been co-brand brand that becomes this tertiary eventually? What you probably become is a white label ingredient provider. It is a long road to commoditization. And it would absolutely accelerate access and maybe even relevance in the short term, but it would destroy differentiation. And if I'm right, 
that real brand health is about the balance of those two things, then turning your back on the core and only looking forward to innovation in this case, these licensed channels is a predictable outcome of brand death. And only those who can avoid the greed and step back and see the value that the ecosystem has only when it is together, really get the bigger picture of value creation. That is the value creation engine for Focus and for Rourke and for each of the stakeholders. The licensees are getting the better end of the deal because the franchise business is healthy. The franchisees are getting the better end of the deal because there are all these other marketing engines out there telling their story that they could never afford to do on their own. And then together, if the product launches and channels and pricing and all of that is smart, it is building a brand that has this accretive ubiquity over time, which is the greatest value driver of all. We love to conclude these conversations with lessons that can be had for both operators and investors. And given you're both a business executive and an investor yourself, it's going to have larger of an impact. We're super excited to distill your experience with Cinnabon, your appreciation for the business and how you can take what you learn there and expand upon it into new areas. I have a few pieces of advice. They've become mantras, rules, frameworks, because I've seen them apply so consistently in many industries with companies at various points in their arc and their curve and their journey and bear the same fruit. One of those frameworks or mantras is simply a mindset that I would encourage everyone to have over time. I mean, the reality is we're all blinded by our own progress and the very things that have made a brand successful in the most recent months or years may be the very things that hold it back from its next curve. And so this phrase, which is born out of something my mom used to write on my birthday cards, which is don't forget where you came from, but don't you dare ever let it solely define you. Our truth is in our roots, but our past is not our anchor. I mean, I remember going in to talk to franchisees, not just about licensing, but about launching smaller cinnamon rolls and things that seemed like intuitive evolutions of the business. And the very people, the franchisees, who have the most vested interest in seeing the business succeed were the very people who fought it the most. And that was because, to their credit, they wanted to protect what had made the business successful. The issue was they had become delusioned about which of those things were still adding the value that they once did. And they were also mistaken in the fear that launching new things would subtract from the power of the core thing. And in the case of the small cinnamon roll, the mini bond, they were worried about trade down. Why would I sell a smaller thing for less when people are buying a bigger thing for more? And the answer is because the universe of people who wanna buy the big thing and the expensive thing is a shrinking population. And the group of people who want to buy the small thing that's half the price is a growing population. And oh, by the way, when it's a lower priced item, people add a drink or they buy two. And so basket actually doesn't drop. Like that takes work from a leadership perspective to help people break through using their past as a crutch and an anchor. That's true in any business. I don't care if it's two years old or 20 years old. So that mantra, I would encourage everyone to go read it, pin it, copy it, put it up somewhere. Ask yourself regularly if you are falling victim to something other than that. Like find a way to use your past as the very thing that drives the future, not the thing that's holding it back. Then I envisioned these bumpers in a growth bowling alley. And on one, so if you've been bowling, you you put the bumpers in place so the ball doesn't go in the gutter. Even if you don't get it right down the middle, which no one does without a lot of practice, you want to ping your way forward, right? One bumper is this phrase. If we don't, the competition will. If we don't, the competition will. Like if our brand isn't there, somebody's brand's going to be there. And just hold that in its own space. On the other side is just because we can do something does not mean we should. It's very easy to get distracted, especially when you have inbound opportunity. For as many things as we at Focus and Cinnabon gets credit for doing, creating, and saying yes to, there are three times as many we said no to. But no one knows those stories. So the idea of finding your healthy place between these two bumpers in the bowling alley is a powerful one. 
to keep you moving forward. One is about fire in the belly, competitive mindset, understanding that great brands can start in any channel and work their way back to your core channel if you're not careful. And whatever you want to call it, moat, protection, defense. But the other is about financial responsibility, good stewardship of limited resources. No matter how big you are, your resources are limited and finding your space between the two. So those frameworks really help a leadership team have a mindset that then can guide behaviors. The third would be know your brand, know what it stands for, be honest about where it has permission to go and put teams in place that help you resource the capabilities that you need and be honest if you need to rent, build, or buy them. We tried manufacturing. It was a bad idea. (laughs) So we partnered with people who were amazing at manufacturing and we sold the plants we built or bought. That was expensive. It was painful, probably a needed lesson. So we didn't get distracted later down the road. But this concept of for omni-channel to really, if you're doing the first two things, you're innovating, you're not letting your past be your anchor, you have a healthy balance between competitiveness and protecting your brand, but not doing too many things and getting distracted. If you're doing that, then you're probably in the ballpark of the initiatives that will drive growth in an omni-channel way. And you've got to be really sure that your brand has permission to go there and then super honest about which piece of that value chain should you be owning. And then share the pie. Don't be afraid to give up a point, two points, 10 points. If someone else can 10X your points of distribution, why would you not share a meaningful percentage of profitability with them for the very real value they bring? So all that to say, you know, don't get in your own way. Kat, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating breakdown. I think Cinnabon is a business that everyone knows and loves, but the true size and scale of the business across 60 countries and billions of dollars of associated sales are remarkable. And it's truly a business, I find, that creates more value for its partners and its franchisees than it captures for itself. And I think that's some of the beauty that you guys have caught and why the brand has proven to be so successful. But this was fascinating and we really appreciate your time. The biggest lesson I took away from the Cinnabon story is about how brands must evolve in a world of e-commerce that is increasingly omnichannel. Cinnabon is focused on franchisee relations in order to foster partnership with all of its stakeholders. For any business, there is a natural imperative to grow, and the opportunity to license the brand is an attractive strategy. But great operators like Cat have demonstrated a long-term vision for their brands and appreciate the risks of overexpansion. When pursuing new channels and partnerships, it's important to never take too much out of the equity bucket. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of Cinnabon with Kat Cole. To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 